are in Studio One Four. That's what I used to record. I like it right out of the gate. The plugin that we're going to be using to get our bass tone today. It's a free plugin. It's the TSE Audio B O D, which is this bad boy right here that you're looking at. It's basically I keep making the bass. Basically, basically, basically every time a Sans amp clone. Now a Sans amp is just a little bass driver uh, that you can use on your pedal board. They make a rack mounted version of it. This is the one that's modeled off of the pedal board version of the Sans amp. It's pretty cool. It's very, very simple and it's awesome. It's available for Mac or Windows in VST and AAX. I like so much love, so much love for this company. There's a couple things that you're gonna wanna keep in mind when it comes to punk bass. Now, the first thing is going to be play style. What I'm talking about is the way that you're actually playing the bass. And you've got a couple options and those are finger styles, soft pick, and hard pick. So if you're playing finger styles, you're basically just playing with your fingers. See these bad boys right here. Now this is a little trickier to play punk rock on. There's definitely bass players that do it though. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a little more of a dull sound and it could be a little harder to get some of those 16th note runs really accurate. Matt Freeman from Rancid, he plays finger styles for the most part and is a fantastic bass player. So obviously this isn't like a, you can't play finger styles. It's all personal preference. You could also use a soft pick. Soft picks are fine. They've got a lot more give to them when you're picking. It'll be a little less attack, more attack than playing finger styles and a little more accuracy for some of those faster eighth or 16th note runs. Um, but it's definitely less attack than the hard pick. Personally, I like hard picks for bass. This one's a, a some sort of Dunlop. I've got a container just full full of picks. Just look look at all these picks of different different persuasions and colors and stuff. It's a, it's a lot. It's a coffin. And I just find personally that I like a hard pick for bass. It gets a lot of that attack, which I find awesome. Again, all personal preference. You can kind of do what you, what feels best to you. Pick a play style and roll with it. So there's also types of basses. So frequently, the bass sound that is associated with punk rock and rock and roll is the P bass sound. This is a P bass. Um, this is my the bass that I got way back in high school, a long, long time ago. And as you can see, I have some uh, uh, unfortunate stickers on it. So the thing about a P bass is a P bass comes with this P pickup, which is a humbucker effectively. You're gonna get just a more even tone and there's going to be none of that 60 cycle hum that comes from a single coil pickup. You could also use a jazz bass. As you can see right here, uh, this is my very first first bass ever, Fender Jazz Bass. It is uh, uh, two single quote pickups, so it's got that 60 cycle hum. You can't tell, it looks a little blue here, but in real life it's more of a purple color, but I'm sure people will, will argue about that. And that kind of sounds like this. Before you get too carried away saying that this one sounds better, uh, it's got newer strings on it. Remember that having new strings can really add to the liveliness uh, and the attack of a, of a bass. So if you are gonna go into the studio to record, it wouldn't hurt to maybe get a new pair of bass strings. The issue with the jazz bass is if you're gonna use something with a single coil pickup, you're gonna wanna put a gate on, otherwise you're gonna get a whole bunch of 60 cycle hum. Uh, here, listen, you'll probably be able to hear it. Now, a gate will get rid of that. And I frequently use this jazz bass right here to do most of my anti-negative recordings because I, I just love it so much. And it's my first bass and it's great. And it's an actual Fender real deal. Uh, MIM made in Mexico jazz bass. I absolutely adore it. It's very heavy though. But for today, because we're doing punk rock, I decided I would I would use the, the P bass because again, more of a quintessential punk rock type sound. Now there's also humbucker basses. They have large humbuckers like the uh, like the Music Man basses. I don't have one of those, so I can't show you that as an example. We're gonna go with a P bass for today, but just know that you've got options. Really, whatever you've got at home will be fine. And using some of these techniques, we can get a good a good bass tone for for everybody. I hope. So let's take a look at the tone. So here we've got this pedal. So this is my, my sound without. And then let's punch this bad boy in. Now immediately you're gonna be like, oh, that sounds way different. Uh, it's way punchier. I took a little bit of the low end out just on the plug-in here. It's all personal preference. You can play around with it to taste if we if we kind of just fiddle around with this a little bit here. Right on the here we've got our level. That's the volume. You've got your drive. 
So you can get pretty dirty with this bad boy. You got your low end. You can really beef it up there if you want to. Your high end. Which I like some good high end. We've got a presence knob. Which is basically just a high pass filter. And then a blend. It sounds pretty decent. Basically, if you fiddle around with the plugin for a little bit, you're gonna get something that sounds halfway decent and you're gonna be able to roll with that. Let's talk about performance. Now, one of the major keys to getting a good bass tone is your performance. So practice your parts, and if you're not a super solid bass player, consider maybe getting one of your friends that plays bass, or maybe even hiring somebody to come play the bass parts for you, because a good performance is gonna trump everything else, right? A good performance trumps a bad bass. You can have an amazing player on a terrible bass and it'll still sound good. So consider that performance is critically important when it comes to getting a good bass tone. Next up, let's talk about arrangement. Another thing that you're gonna to wanna to keep in mind is that the arrangement is going to affect the way the bass sounds. Uh, if you want a part to come in that's really, really heavy with the guitars, you're gonna want the bass playing the root notes to what the guitars are playing. It's going to cohesively glue everything together and it will come in heavier. If you want um, more uh, of a dynamic part, then maybe having the bass play something like a harmony, having it do like octave jumps or something like that, it's gonna change the way things sound. And then if you want, if you want a part where the bass sticks out more, take the guitars away. If you if you go from a lower part of the bass to a higher part, it's going to affect the way that song sounds sonically, and that will change the way that your bass is going to sound. And all of these are things you can do before you even consider trying to use plugins. Having an understanding of your arrangement and what the bass is doing in the context of the song with the other instruments is also going to be paramount for getting a good bass tone for your song. And let's talk about recording. When you are recording your bass, you want to get a nice and high level. You get a lot more handle over these transients that we're looking at right here, and that'll allow you to be able to edit a lot better. You won't have to crank up the volume, and then you run the risk of having um, digital noise that comes in from the background. Try to aim for minus six at your peaks, which is when it starts to go yellow. If you're looking here at the, the fader, you know, I'm in and around that area. That way you have the optimal level coming out of your guitar for you to work with later. And let's take a look at mixing this bad boy. This is just the bass. Sounds pretty good. Let's bring in the overdrive. Which just makes it a little more present, gives it a lot more life. I have a compressor on here, it's not doing a lot, uh, minus two, it's just to catch some of the dynamic peaks and just smooth the bass out a little bit. I don't want to get rid of the peaks and transients. Frequently what I do and what a lot of people do is they'll have a really distorted bass that is kind of the present attack part that'll be mixed in and you'll get a lot of that 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 uh, mid-rangey, high mid-range, low mid-range sound. That'll kind of stick out, whereas then you'll have kind of a low bass that'll be cleaner and more compressed that'll kind of get that fat low end. This is this is my my pointy uh, distorted-esque attack bass. Basically just grabbing the top a little bit, evening it out as a whole. The attack is not super fast. The release is really long, so I'm just kind of just kind of holding on some of those really aggressive transients. And then finally, I have an EQ. So, I'll just punch it in and out. Yeah, so I'm not doing a lot here in terms of the EQ. Uh, looks like I'm rolling off a bit of the low end, which we're gonna make up for later, so don't worry about it. I have a bit of a, a boost here, probably because it sounded good, honestly. There's a pretty good, pretty good chance that everything that I did here was just because I thought it sounded good. Looks like I'm pushing some of this low end which makes sense, that's a good sounding frequency. I've got 430-ish, which is actually a little bit of boxiness. If we take it out, it actually sounds a little flatter, a more even bass tone, but I think when it was mixed in with the guitars, this just really made the bass stand out. I've also got this 3K boost. Now, I like it a little better 
by itself without the 3k boost 2k it's a 2k boost there's a bit of a 2k boost and it's kind of the natural boost of the high-end drive i think it sounds a little better without it when you're listening to just the bass it's a little flatter and more even but when the guitars and the drums are going having this little boost here really brings the bass out as a whole see i just think it sounds a little bit better with that boosted Oh, it looks like I have a small boost around 5K. Let's see what's going on there. Oh, it's just some buzzy top end. And then I'll roll off the, uh, the, the, the high end just above where I've got that boosted. That's just keeping it from getting in the way of the cymbals. If possible, try rolling off the high end of certain instruments, the bass especially, because you don't need a ton of high end over five or six, 7K maybe, depending on Again, how your bass is recorded and what's what sound you're going for and what you're trying to create. But you've got all that high end that's happening from the guitars and from the vocals and from the cymbals. And if you have instruments that just have that high end in there, it's going to kind of take up space that if you get rid of it, it'll allow those instruments to breathe more and you won't have to fight with high end as much. So that's how the bass sounds with all of these things in. I'm just going to turn them on and off. As you can see, it's a big difference. I'm doing a fair amount to it to get to get the sound that I want, but that's the sound that I'm looking for. So next up, I'm going to bring in what I like to call the, the fat, fat bass. It's really that's really dumb. So this is a technique that I that I found out about from uh, Nirvana actually. Uh, Butch Vig did this with the bass on Nevermind, and I think it sounds fantastic. And I do it uh, all the time now. And that's basically just creating a, a low end bass. I'll send the bass on a pre send. So, this is before any of the effects that I've done are happening to this bass. It's splitting off to this uh, fat bass with the channel. Then I take this EQ right here, and as you can see, I, it's a pretty aggressive uh, roll off. I have it rolled off around 60 hertz um, on the low end, and then the high end is rolling off around 300 hertz. It's all just, just tasty, tasty low end. After I EQ it, I will run it through a compressor that is just obliterating this bass, just totally smashing it straight to hell. You know, just really taking it, just giving it the business. So I've got it at about eight to one, and the attack is set super duper fast, so it catches every single transient as it's happening, uh, and then a really long release so that the compressor stays active for a long time. Then I'm just, I'm smashing it. I think I'm doing like minus, minus eight or minus 10 uh, dB in gain reduction. I want it to be a hot dog, a bass, Hot dog, because that's awesome. It delicious, delicious, delicious stuff. This way I can make the bass sit below the attack of the kick drum and carry a solid, continuous low end. And then I'll take this bass, this, this flat audio sausage bass that is just crushed into oblivion and is effectively only low end, and I'll run it through a chorus. And that just makes it hugely wide, so, so wide. And it gets it a little out of the way of the more present instruments like the attack bass and the kick and the snare. And it evens it out, puts it behind those instruments and takes up a lot of flat, stable, low end that isn't going anywhere. So I'm gonna go back and forth and show you what this sounds like with and without. So that's just the low end bass. And that's it with all the effects. Bring up the dirty bass with it. And you hear them both together. 
there's a dog barking in the background. Then what I'll do is I'll run the two bases together through an aux send so that I have independent volume control over both of them together. And then if there's any trouble frequencies, I can I can EQ them both together. That's it. That's how I'll do bass um, for the most part. The EQs are, are different depending on if I'm using the jazz bass or the P bass and what song I'm doing, but this is just what I think sounded good for this example song. And you don't need to do exactly the EQs that I did or exactly the compression that I did. You need to play it by ear and it's different for every single song and every single situation. This is just an idea of kind of how I approach doing a punk rock bass sound. And now I hear you, I hear you saying, but Andy, but Andy, I, I really like this tone that you've got, but it's not dirty enough. I needs me a super heckin dirty, dirty, dirty bass. And to which I say, all right, friend, check this out. This is the Dirty plugin, and it's also free. This is the TSE Audio R47, which is a Proco Rat clone that you can get for free. So I highly suggest you go get it. Again, TSE Audio is on point with their clone plugins. This thing is great, and I love using it for distorted bass. Now, I won't use it for my main, main bass sound anymore. Now I've started using an Ampeg clone to get that mid-range. I love this thing so much so 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 much now you need to keep in mind that if you're using highly distorted guitars you don't really want to use a highly distorted bass because it's just going to mush together in a mushy pile of not so sounding good fart distort dirt yeah so if you want to use a highly distorted bass sound make sure it's in a section of your song that you either have cleaner guitars and you're using the distortion in the bass to get that kind of like hot tasty spicy gritty grit or you have the guitars go away to poke out the distorted, distorted bass, because otherwise you're just gonna lose it all into mush. Now, a trick that is used frequently in um, more modern pop, punk, punk rock kind of stuff is to actually have less distorted guitars and more distorted bass, um, which is totally acceptable and sounds really awesome if you know what you're doing, and I encourage you to play around with it. But if you don't wanna do that, you can use the slightly more mid-rangey, cleaned up bass sound and heavier distorted guitars. So to get this spicy, spicy lead tone, I've done a couple things here. So this is the, the thing without, which just sounds like the bass by itself. I have a gate running to uh, rein in some of the uh, some of the buzzing from the rat. I would suggest that you run a gate when you're when you're using this pedal because it's going to it's get, it's gonna have some some humming and some and some buzzing and the gate will help you. I have a bit of a compressor doing about four to one compression ratio. Doing like you know maybe minus two or minus three dB again just to just to, to rein in some of the crazy peaks on this really distorted bass. Um, I think it helps. <laughs> flattens things out. And next I've got a bit of an EQ. Basically just, just accenting some high and mid high, just so it peaks out a little bit over the drums to be a lead instrument in this case. And then I'm running everything through my favorite thing. It's just my favorite thing ever is running it through a chorus just to, just to widen it up and make it sound thick. I love chorus. I put it on so much stuff, lead guitars, lead bass, which is definitely not really a thing. I would suggest you play around with chorus. You don't have to go crazy with it. You just use it as kind of a width thinning tool, which is the only thing that I'm using it for here is just to, to wide out the bass a little bit, to take up a little more sonic space so the drums can do their thing and not the, the two things aren't fighting together because they're taking up different sonic areas in the song. And just to really, really bring it home, I've got an effect send going. I've got a little bit of a delay and a reverb, so let's let's just bring those up. So I have a analog delay that is doing eighth note uh, delay. So it it fills things out a little bit, and then I've got it running through a reverb just to just to soften out the delay a little bit. Which
that's an old trick. Run your delays into a reverb to, to, to soften them out a little bit because delays can be frequently harsh. And that's effectively all that I've done to get this song. And that's how I would approach using a lead bass sound. So all together you get this. Mm-hmm. 